Chapter 4 The Great Karmic Warehouse Sutra 4 However profound it is, everything that comes from memory spells karmic bondage. Categories of Consequence In the previous chapter, we looked at the eight membranes of memory, four of which are collective and four of which are individual. However, the yogic system now leads us deeper into an exploration of individual karma. If you find yourself overwhelmed by the classifications that follow, do not get disheartened. As a reader, you do not have to remember these categories in order to decode karma. It will certainly be easy to dispense with these classifications to make a karma book a simpler, breezier read, but if I include them, it is to reveal the incredible intellectual precision and sophistication of which the ancient yogis and sages were capable. Even if you were to simply read these categories without making any attempt to remember them, you would have a deeper and richer understanding of the subject. The workings of karma are complex, but the classification is a simple one. Let us look at four essential categories of karma or consequence. Behind every individual is one vast storehouse of karma. The sum total of accumulated memory in Sanskrit termed Sanchita. For our purpose, let us simply call it accumulated karma. This is like a great warehouse in which all eight types of memory are contained. Elemental, atomic, evolutionary, genetic, individual, karmic, sensory, articulate and inarticulate. We carry this enormous volume of information with us all the time. The quantity might vary, but every human being carries this phenomenal karmic inheritance. Now, within this vast storehouse of accumulated memory, there is an important dimension called allotted karma. This in turn contains two aspects. Let us call them actionable karma in the present and actionable karma in the future. Let us look at what these terms imply. From the vast storehouse of Sanchita, a segment of memory ripens. It surfaces and comes into the forest, demanding immediate attention. This is your allotted karma. Every human being has a certain allotment of karma for a lifetime called Parabdha Karma in the Indian tradition. It is the karma that needs to be handled now. The rest continues to remain latent and unripe in the vast storehouse of accumulated memory. So your current lifetime is a certain allotment of karma a distinct amount of memory playing itself out. <clears throat> the nature of this allotment varies from person to person. For each person, the life energy works differently. Every person has a different percentage of energy dedicated to physical activity, a different percentage to intellectual activity, a different percentage to emotional activity, a different percentage to energy activity, and a different percentage to the capacity for meditativeness or inner stillness. The nature of a person's allotment is actually visible at an early age. Parents can see it clearly in two children. One may have a certain propensity for physical activity, while the other may be quieter. These differences are sometimes even subtly visible in newborn infants in a hospital maternity ward. Later, of course, differences grow because of type of the environment the child grows up in, the food they eat, the type of attitudes they develop. But very early differences are determined by the nature of child's allotted karma. Now, every spiritual process is essentially about digging into the storehouse of accumulated karma. Spiritual practitioners are people in a hurry. They want to dig up as much information and, as possible and work it out rather than wait for each allotment to ripen in its own time. This is why so much of the spiritual process is action-oriented. Spiritual seekers want to handle 10 lifetimes of karma in a single lifetime if they can. 
The spiritual journey also teaches them to avoid accumulating new karma and to limit the consequences of their allotted karma. In this manner, they work through large karmic volumes that create speed. How does one feel when one has emptied out one's allotted karma? Usually life grows more relaxed, less reactive, less compulsive. Strong likes, likes and dislikes, whether about people, places, food, work or politics begins to weaken. Comfort zones become less important. Initially you may find you want to slow down and live quietly. After that you will choose to engage with the world again. But this time it will be in a wonderfully conscious way. Your life will be now full of choices. We now come to another aspect of allotted karma. This is actionable karma in the present. Kriya mana karma or karma that compels outward action. We cannot resist its power. There are many impulses and propensities in a human being, but not all of them propel us to external action. However, every individual carries another type of karma that must be acted upon externally. The rest can be handled internally. How you handle your external actionable karma in the present is significant because it creates consequences for the future. When some trigger compels action, how consciously you perform that action becomes important. If you do it unconsciously, that unconsciousness will generate an enormous amount of karma. And this is how karma perpetuates itself. Take the human population as an example. The moment two people act, you have consequences. A man and a woman get together and may produce a child. This is a simple physical example of how actions breed consequences. But the consequences can be on many levels in terms of thoughts, emotions, ideas, opinions and actions. Here is where the idea of good karma becomes important. You can alter your future by simply performing the right kind of actions in the present. You can transform your future without any spiritual process, without any elevation in consciousness when you perform the right actions today. A positive future is assured. But if you become meditative, you go a step further. Every spiritual tradition has encouraged people to meditate for this reason. When you become meditative, you do not merely create passive karma. You stop breeding karma altogether. In all spiritual traditions, to become an ascetic means justice. You stop breeding karmic consequences. Let me offer a personal example. As a guru, when I'm conducting a spiritual program, I am in a particular mood. If I embrace everyone before me with tears of joy and inclusiveness, it will not breed any karmic consequences. But if I do the same thing with own with one person whom I know well, that same embrace will create consequences. This is because the inclusive embrace has no karmic substance to it. It's absolutely conscious action. This is why at a program I never focus on the faces I know well. If I choose to meet another's gaze, I always speak a totally unknown face to address. As soon as you focus on someone you know and talk to them, it can turn into an entangling process. It would breed consequences for them, for me, for the entire situation. However, if I'm developing a project, I do of course talk to intimate groups of people. I know this will not breed any entangling consequences for them because what we are evolving is not about them or me but about a larger vision this is not entanglement because it's an all inclusive involvement there's nothing selective about it look at it this way if your actions are coming from memory they'll most certainly breed karma we always say therefore that all human actions can only be of two kinds those that destroy karma karma nashana and those that breed karma karma vriddhi as a guru my business is to impart technologies that promote the former so how do you handle your actionable karma in the present is very important if you are not conscious about it you may think you are spiritual but you may simply be spiraling into entanglement in modern day terminology 
you can see the unconscious mind as accumulated karma sanchita the subconscious mind as allotted karma prabdha and the conscious mind as actionable karma in the present kriyamana this is not entirely accurate but it in its own most broad terms it's useful to understand the differences we now come to the other aspect of allotted karma this is your actionable karma in the figure agami karma your unconscious action today in terms of thought emotion or action will lead to consequences that compel your actions tomorrow or a year later or some would say even a lifetime later in other words no matter what you do life will drive you into a place where you have to act if you borrow from a bank for instance or have a mortgage your karma of tomorrow is determined by today's action similarly if you have a child you're committing yourself to at least 20 year project you have to think about providing for the child sending them to school putting them through college ensuring that they stand on their own feet what you do or do not do tomorrow is not decided by a whim a simple action breeds enormous consequences it is actionable karma in the future that perpetuates the human cycles of compulsion a compulsive action leading to what the indian spiritual tradition sees as cycles of birth and death it propels human beings to return to the embodied state time and again in order to work out their karmic inheritance if you find the idea of future lifetimes problematic do not be distracted by it at this stage nor is it essential to an understanding of karma for the true yogi there's just one life yesterday may have been dressed in one way today you may be dressed in another love life however stays unchanged if you handle your actionable karma in the present consciously you'll not breed any compulsive actionable karma in the future that is the key to handling memory let me stress that there's nothing wrong with a bank loan or a mortgage or a family indeed the more complex your karmic memory is the more varied and interesting your life becomes but the aim to enjoy the process of life but the aim is to be be able to enjoy the process of life not be trapped by it and the importance of eliminating all manner of unconscious karma you do not want to accumulate any karma that will compel you to act compulsively in the future to continue with the earlier analogy when conducting a program i embrace everyone inclusively and choicelessly i do not choose to favor one over the other if i were selective the spiritual transformation a transmission would not be as effective it's a choicelessness of my action that makes it impactful the karmic trap is always in the choosing choice is the greatest human gift freedom is a human freedom is a great human possibility however instead of choosing inclusively most human beings choose selectively most choose on basis of compulsive likes and dislikes on the basis of, of attraction and aversion but when your involvement is absolute that is inclusive you are not operating of past memory this means that there's no compulsion no consequence no entanglement no choice no friend no foe when you perform actionable karma in the present like this you breed no actionable karma in the future whatsoever on the other hand if you choose to involve yourself selectively based on past memory the consequence lives with you you are breeding more memory whether physical emotional or intellectual you're creating karma that will compel you into situations where you have to act in the future once you understand how karmic mechanism works you have a basic difference between involvement and entanglement most people do not understand the fact that it is possible to be absolutely involved without getting entangled for instance when i meet a stranger or a friend my interiority remains the same my involvement is total i may communicate and act differently but i internally i remain the same my way of being remains unchanged although i do what i although what i do or say is relevant to the situation and the person this breeds no karma when involvement is selective you fall into the trap of entanglement here is the central problem 
selective involvement leads to suffering and karma detachment leads to lifelessness but involvement need not come from a place of memory it can be conscious for most people involvement springs from memory and is compulsive once memory enters action is enslaving without memory however you can operate consciously when your action is unsullied by past impressions it is liberating from being to doing to having <clears throat> the human equation was always meant to be like this to move from being to doing to having this means we are never meant to act in order to find fulfillment fulfillment was seen as an inner condition it couldn't be pursued externally we act in order to express our fulfillment not to acquire it we act in order to celebrate our inner completeness not to pursue it for most people however the simple equation is reversed most people do in order to be they act because they feel an in- incomplete their action is prompted by a desire to acquire something or to enhance their identity in some way This is the ancient hunter gatherer impulse which still endures in human beings. It is the need to act in order to accumulate whether it is physical, emotional or intellectual satisfaction. It is action required or impelled by a desire to augment themselves to become more than what they are. They act in order to have and they have in order to be this is tragic most people have already determined what they want to do or what they want to have therefore their doing is invariably to acquire something someone wants to earn fame so they might get into movies or write a book for instance their identity is now film star or author they identify with this label it now determines their being Similarly someone else wants to acquire the status of a sportsman or politician or businessman people even go around calling themselves golfers I play golf and write books and ride motorcycles but I'm not a golfer an author or a biker I am not doing in order to acquire an identity the way I am is untouched by what I do I'm not a yogi because I teach yoga it is not my activity that makes me a yogi it is my being that makes me a yogi Yogi is a description of my inner condition not my activity. When you live like this you who you are always communicates itself in its own subtle ways to people. The fragrance of who you are always gets conveyed. People sense that I'm operating from this place of inner freedom even if they don't understand how it works. Very young people come up to me and treat me like their contemporary or even the close friend they call me sadguru but it's not a term of distance reverence it's one of familiarity of affection now if my talks were about quoting from a scripture such friendship and affection would be impossible scripture means memory memory means hierarchy this hierarchy turns one thing into sacred and another into filthy what we consider sacred becomes an authority what comes from an authority becomes our truth and this kind of truth renders us incapable paradoxically or even experiencing real truth we have reached a point today where authority has become the truth but soon as we turn inward we realize that the truth is the only authority However profound it is all that comes from memory spells karmic bondage I do not come from a place of karma so I do not breed karma It is as simple as that what I say comes from inner experience from a state of knowing not from previously acquired knowledge this is chitta content less intelligence The one thing about human beings simultaneously The one thing that human beings simultaneously suffer and cherish is memory. You try to acquire and freeze memory in order to acquire an identity. You're trying therefore to do in order to be. But neither your identity nor your memory is essentially about you. 
think about it when you're sitting in a cafe drinking your cappuccino you can enjoy only your four dollars worth of coffee whether you have 10 billion dollars in the bank is irrelevant the money exists only in your memory to carry money around in your memory means you are a creature of the past if you base your future on your past you are as good as dead and this is why faces around us are becoming so grave the grave is after all the abode of the past and that is karma too a habitat of the past your actionable karma in the future ensures that your future is exactly like your past when nothing new happens to you it is time to rest in peace the causes of unease and disease a lot of karma in most human beings has its own level of complexity a large part of it is devoted to physical action other segments are devoted to thought emotions and meditativeness the problem of modern life is that most people's physical and emotional energy does not find full expression in a lifetime people in civilized society carry a great deal of unexpressed emotion with them now if emotions never find full expression the energy can turn around and become deeply damaging to one's health and well-being this accounts for the upswinging of depression and mental illness across the world it is said that one out of every 5 americans suffer from some form of psychological illness in a given year and 50% will suffer a mental ailment at some point in their lives a staggering statistic the problem is that civilized society regards the an uninhibited un- 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 expression of emotion as a sign of weakness or a sign of or a lack of sophistication the suppression can create untold havoc in human system I would say 90% of people in the world never find full expression for their emotions. They are afraid of their love, their joy, their grief, everything. To laugh loudly is a problem. It is seen as a non-gentle or unlady un- or unladylike. To cry loudly is a problem. It is seen as unrefined and indecorous. We have set up a deeply restrictive culture for ourselves. Now Uh, the major problem of your allotted karma is devoted to physical activity the body remains the major source of identification for most people even today so the ratio varies from person to person 95% of the time allocated karma is oriented towards external action however the level of activity in modern life has decreased drastically because people do not use their body the way they were used to If this unused energy remains dormant in your system it could easily cause disease. The modern mind is going through a unique kind of neurosis for this reason. When you involve yourself intensely in physical activity you spend a great deal of nervous energy. But now that human beings have become so inactive almost every person suffers from one kind of anxiety or unease. This is simply because of trapped physical energy. In comparison you will find that those committed to some form of intense physical exercise often at a different level of balance and peace and much less entangled in sexuality and other physical drives this is because one aspect of the person has found full expression one fallout of inactivity is disease trapped energy can also cause physical restlessness and agitation which accounts for the state of chronic unease and disquiet that plagues the modern individual you will notice that every day the very way people sit and stand reveals an absence of ease they may have brought a practice gracefulness to their movements but the unease remains if you take away the unease in your movement it shifts inward to another dimension where it's easy for it to find expression in other words it will build into your energy In time this disquiet on the level of energy manifests as disease. In the Isha Yoga Center many many seekers are put into such intense states of activity that one might wonder why those on the spiritual path are working 20 hours a day. In popular perception spirituality means someone half dozing under a tree. This is far from truth. 
The intense physical work at Isha is an integral part of the spiritual journey. I want these people to finish all their allotted karma in a certain period of time. It is impossible to perform physical activity without your thought, emotion and energies being involved. The same activity can of course be performed with different levels of involvement. Those who work only for a livelihood often feel constrained and suffocated. But when you're deeply involved in your work on every level, you'll find activity invigorates you. It doesn't exhaust you. Once you expand this karma, there'll be no need for compulsive action. After this action will be by choice. When the allotted karma has been worked out, you can ask a person to simply sit still and there will be no struggle. The body will comply effortlessly. In the higher level Isha programs, we put people through immense body breaking activity so that afterwards they are able to sit without moving. Meditation now happens naturally when energy allotted for physical activity remains unused in the system. You cannot meditate because the energy will make you restless and ill at ease. There are certain all other aspects to disease environmental factors as well as karmic reasons from genetic factors to personal karmic reasons play a part in why energy functions in a certain way and causes disease however for many people are ill because they are not handling their allotted karma sensibly one aspect of energy being used to a considerable extent is today's in today's world is mental energy However, the overuse of mental energy leads to a lopsided development and invariable advent of disease. Consider a country's national budget. A certain amount is allocated for education, a certain amount for industry, a certain percentage for agriculture, development, defense, and so on. But if all these are not being expanded, the economic uh, and the economy suffers. The same happens within the body. Those who have led a complete life often reach a certain natural state of peace and balance when they age. As the allotted karma starts winding down, you may notice changes in elderly people. You may find that their sleep quota comes down, and when they do sleep, you might find that they sleep deeply. This could be a sign that allotted karma is drawing to an end. The great karmic warehouse remains, but one installment has begun drawing to its close. A word of caution, deep sleep doesn't necessarily mean end of allotted karma, but in the elderly, it could be one of the possible indications. When one installment of karma is over, the inner turmoil recedes and a new serenity and equipoise descends. Some accomplished practitioners may go beyond their allotted karma. This could give them a certain aura of peace, but they still have not transcended their accumulated karma. They have moved from the retail shop to the warehouse, but they still have plenty of karma in stock. For the spiritual seeker, allotted karma can be seen as cream on the milk. It is the karma that has surfaced in this lifetime. If you boil the milk well, the cream can further increase. So the spiritual process is a way of cooking oneself sufficiently to pick up as much karma from your karmic warehouse as possible in this lifetime and deal with it while you are conscious and able-bodied. The goal for every freedom seeker is the same, to attend your karma now rather than wait for life to throw it at you. Sadhana If you are experiencing deep emotional stress, a simple practice is to remain as far as possible in a posture where your spine is erect. The lumbar region in particular needs to be relaxed and stretched to activate the spine. If you are able to squat for lengths of time, this this is particularly beneficial because the extension of spine has a profound impact on psychological well-being. A natural upsurge of energy will happen if you keep your feet together when you squat. But not many people can do this, so the next best option is to widen the distance between the feet when you squat keeping your feet in line with your shoulders make sure your feet are firmly on the ground this is not just an exercise 
The spine is not merely a collection of bones. It is the very basis of communication and perception within the human system. Keeping it in optimal condition will not only revitalize and rejuvenate the body, but it will make a phenomenal difference in your mental and emotional life and the way you function. There is a more comprehensive seven-step practice called the Yoga Namaskar, which is offered free of charge on the Sadhguru app. This is a powerful process of activating and strengthening the spine and muscle alongside it. So, as one ages, the spinal system doesn't collapse and the nerves are not pinched. If there's already spinal damage, this is a good way to regenerate the spine and ensure all-around benefits for the entire body. This is also a more scientific approach to unblocking emotional impasses in the human system and promoting what we call Chitta Vriddhi Nirodha, the liberation of consciousness from fluctuations and bottlenecks.